so my name is Thomas Kurian. I come from R&D uh, at Micronic, and I'll be talking about uh, a few topics. One will be uh, our success in flat panel displays, uh, our re-emergence in, into semiconductors, and then our uh, foray into deep learning. So a little bit about Micronic. We are an equipments manufacturer working mostly in uh, electronic production. Uh, we've got two main business areas. One is assembly solutions, which is the um, assembly and inspection of printed circuit boards. And then the other side, which is uh, pattern generators, which is both mask writers and metrology equipment. We're, uh, uh, we were founded about 40 years ago outside of Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we're currently 1,300 employees spread out over 50 countries uh, with a very wide patent portfolio and customers all around the world. So a little quickly about uh, display production. Um, uh, making a display, we make photo masks. I think uh, you guys probably all know this, but just a quick review. Uh, we make a photo mask that takes uh, about 28, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, it is in a very like controlled environment. Uh, then after it's been inspected and processed, it goes into a liner where you then make your flat panel displays in about 20 seconds or each layer gets made in about uh, 20 seconds. So it's a, a, it's a very efficient way to do this in mass, uh, for mass production. And currently we enjoy a unique position as the sole supplier of mask writers to the display industry. There's a few reasons for this, um, which I will get into. Uh, one of them is we can handle very large photo masks. So for displays, uh, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, transfer. So if you have an 80-inch television, you need an 80-inch mask or a little bit more. Um, uh, and so our largest masks are, uh, can handle 1.8 by 2 meters. Um, another thing that's challenging specifically for display is there is um, an issue called mura, which is a Japanese word, which means irregularity. Um, and what this means is there can be some sort of disturbance uh, in the machine that is too small to measure. So if you were to actually measure your uh, CD uniformity, everything would look great. But because our eyes are such great at pattern, uh, are so great at pattern recognition, it will pick out these patterns immediately. And if it exists on the mass, you'll see it in your final display as well. So you can see on the picture on the right, there's this sort of wavy pattern. So we've got lots of compensation for um, all the different types of Mura that we have. And also we do this at um, very precisely and accurately. And when I say precisely and accurately, we're talking about the nanometer scale. Uh, our, we have a global registration over these 1.2 by 2 meters of 100 nanometers. We've got a mask repeatability of seven nanometers and a CD uniformity of um, a three sigma of less than 40 nanometers. Um, and we maintain this over 24 to 48 hours. So we also have a very good climate control where we maintain um, plus or minus one millikelvin. Um, the trends in the display industry also work in our favor. There's um, things that are happening we see more and more mass complexity, which is driven by this change from LCDs to OLED. We see uh, more and more, uh, uh, more and more phones are being made, which need higher and higher resolution because you hold them closer to your face. Uh, and also, there's the uh, uh, our classical driver uh, of displays, which is um, uh, which is TVs, and uh, TVs uh, tend to grow one to two inches per year, and they've been doing that for a very long time. Uh, and also, uh, uh, displays are now in more and more applications. You can expect to see displays in cars or home appliances. You, you interact with a lot of electronics and you tend to interact through a display. Uh, so that's uh, our sort of success in the photo mask industry. And now we move over to our uh, reintroduction into the semicon market, uh, which I will get into. Um, Micronic has existed previously in, uh, in this market, and we were out for a bit, now we're back. Um, so the thinking behind this is we have uh, a greater and greater need for processing power in more and more devices. Uh, you can expect to have a smart home with uh, your fridge and all sorts of, uh, um, even your fire alarms, 
temperature, uh, what is it, thermostat, uh, every, uh, autonomous vehicles, drones, uh, um, scooters, skateboards, all sorts of things need some level of processing power. Now, most of these, uh, now typically, the leading edge has been uh, led by um, computers, uh, but there's uh, there's still a lot of growth, and most of the growth that is uh, projected to happen will happen in these sort of lower uh, levels. Um, and, wait, let me go back a second. Uh, and we can see that uh, while on the very small uh, nodes, we have um, most, mostly E-beam or mix in E-beam and laser, in the higher modes, we have still a lot of lasers. So uh, based on... Um, the mask maker survey from eBeam, uh, we uh, we can see that 600,000 masks enable the semicon industry, and still 70 to 75 percent of them are still written by laser. Now, the last generation of laser semicon writers were installed between uh, 15 to 20 years ago, so they're reaching end of life. They're um, they're harder to service, they're harder to do any development on, they're harder to find replacement parts for. Uh, so we expect uh, a sort of reinvestment uh, into replacing these machines. And so that is the uh, segment we aim to capture here. Uh, so, the, uh, so in those modes, and you can see that there's still a, the leading edge will still be mostly e-beam, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of space there for the mature semicon market. So the value proposition for Micronic is that the SLX will deliver the lowest cost with reliable operation from a long-term committed supplier for the best overall value. And a few um, specs, it's, uh, it, it'll be available in many different configurations. We'll be expecting uh, the fastest write time for a six inch plate will be from 20 minutes and up. Uh, and all, we, aim, uh, we will meet all the requirements down to the 90 nanometer node. So to do this, we will all, of course, need new tools and techniques, which is how we get into deep learning. So I think uh, one thing that I think we're becoming more and more aware of is that data is, is valuable. And our machines produce a lot of it. So this is a, a sketch of our display machine, uh, the one that runs for 24 to 48 hours. We log lots of axes uh, at 200 hertz, so for two days. Um, so this produces between five to 10 gigs of data. And what we currently do with this is we stitch it together so that we can see sort of 2D surfaces. And this tells you how the machine performed while printing the mask. Uh, and as I mentioned, Mura, this is a great way of seeing these sorts of um, sort of disturbances. You can see a little line there. Um, for our customers, they look. Uh, this data is presented to them in uh, in the format. Uh, so, sorry, to sort of be able to digest this, you kind of need to be a system expert. Um, it's not really. It's it's hard to sort of pick out what is normal and what is abnormal. So for our customers, we have a tool where we give them uh, using basic statistical analysis, so averages, standard deviations, FFTs, uh, and a little traffic light to say if was there a problem or not. This is kind of good, but it, it has uh, some limited value because it's applied globally on the entire mask, and it's hard to pinpoint exactly where the problem was. So what usually happens is they uh, give us the logs if there's an issue, uh, and we sit around and we look at it and then we pinpoint it. And this is done like uh, with humans, like we sit around uh, and uh, analyze these. And this gives us uh, a great transition, like this is a great task for deep learning, which is uh, where we come to the CDLE. So a little bit about CDLE, how it works is there is a long-term assignee who is Roman, uh, uh, based here in uh, San Jose, who gets a deep dive into uh, deep learning from our experts. And then uh, every three months, we have an assignee who comes to do a short-term stay to get, uh, sort of to, to immerse himself in uh, deep learning and work on an actual project. So I am the fifth assignee from Micronic. 
uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about the actual project that I'm working on, which is using anomaly detection, uh, use, uh, anomaly detection using autoencoders. So the idea, be, and this is just one of the techniques uh, that we've learned that I've learned about at uh, CDLE. So an autoencoder is just a neural network where our input data is one of these surfaces, and we train it so that the output data matches the input as close as possible. So we reduce the dimensionality, and then we increase the dimensionality. Um, and so what this is, is a very fancy copy-paste machine. Now you can ask yourself, why is this useful? Well, it's because after it's been trained, we can put in new data. So if we put in new data, and we check the output and compare it with the input, uh, well, I should also mention, we only train it using normal data, data that we've judged to be entirely normal. So when we uh, put in new data, if it manages to reproduce uh, reproduce it faithfully, then we know that we've got normal data. If we get some feature that it has never seen before, it will attempt to, uh, to make a copy of it, and it will fail. So the difference between your input and output will be very large. And this is also good for us because this gives us a very like fine-grained approach to where the differences are. So afterwards, you can get a heat map telling you, okay, where are the... Um, for our customers, it can be used as a way of telling where should inspection be done. For our service engineers, it's like uh, a way of seeing where should they concentrate their efforts. Um, and this is just our first attempt, uh, and I think it's been very successful so far. And one thing I've learned at CDLE is that part of deep learning and big data is getting into this mindset of using the data. So moving forward, as we develop new machines, we enter into this, uh, we, at the design phase, we can also already start thinking about how do we collect data? Which data do we want to collect? Uh, how should we, how should it be stored? How should it be transferred? And these are things we're dealing with right now. And then after that, we've now got a wide variety of tools, like new tools that we didn't know about two years ago, uh, to, to analyze them. Some of them could be just same statistical methods, but it could also be deep learning methods. And of course, the end, end product here, the goal is, of course, to create this into some sort of value for the customer. It could be in the form of preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance, improved quality control, or even just future development ideas. So that was my talk. Thank you.